turn to Acts chapter 9, beginning with verse Just because we have a huge life change, a great transformation does not mean that everything will go smooth. Not only that, but just because we have the call of God does not mean that everything will go smooth. Now, we would like to think that there's nothing that's going to happen to Christians uh, because we're protected by God, but that is not how God set up the world. God set up the world with um, free will, freedom. One of the reasons that we as Americans value freedom so much is because that's what God put in our hearts. People want to be free. But um, there is an enemy to freedom. There's always an enemy to freedom. Since the beginning of America, there's always been someone that's trying to overcome our freedom. And the same is true in the kingdom of God. From the moment you accept Jesus Christ, there will always be someone trying to conquer your salvation. And that's what this is about. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill Saul. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gate day and night to kill him. Um, the devil does not work alone. A devil doesn't work alone. He doesn't just use demon spirits to do his work. Now, he does use demon spirits to do his work today, just like in Bible times. But not only that, the devil copies what God does. So how does God work on the earth? Sometimes the spirit moves and things happen on the earth. That's one way. Sometimes... Through the speaking of the word of God, something happens. How does God get things done? For example, um, this church has been standing here for many years, but one time in history, in the past, there was an empty space here. How did this church get here? She said, the assemblies of God built it. See, God worked through human hands. Now, that's exactly the same way that the devil works. Sometimes the devil works through human hands. Many times I have seen people begin to grow in the spirit. And they're like growing, growing in the spirit. And then all of a sudden, sudden, something happens. Most often, um, with single people, most often,
often what happens is a single person and then all of a sudden a, a man or a woman pops up in the church and they get all fascinated with them or they meet someone outside of the church and they get all fascinated with them and then instead of staying after God and letting God do a work in their life, they go chasing and they start going down, 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 down in their spirit. No. We have to guard our spiritual growth. There's, sometimes it's a job. Sometimes a person has been looking, 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 looking for work for a long time and they couldn't find a job. And then they get saved and they're really growing, growing, growing in the Lord. And a wonderful job pops up and it just happens to hit that they would have to work on Sundays. And the people grab the job and then you see their spiritual life that was not just an accident that was the plan of the enemy just like here they plotted they planned against Saul same thing the enemy plans against you we have to be smart about what the enemy is doing this situation Saul knows. It says it became known to Saul what they were doing. Now, this verse does not tell us how it became known. Maybe someone told him, like I'm telling you tonight, don't let someone pull you away from God. Don't let a relationship pull you away from God. Don't let a job pull you away from God. But I need money. I have to work. What am I going to do? If you are patient and just wait for God's timing, God will provide you a job that doesn't conflict with your spiritual development. Yeah. God will provide. Oh, we just sang, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. But many times instead, we just, just, we get so nervous, we get so afraid, and we're just like grab something that's not the right thing for our spiritual life. Sometimes people move. I have noticed that sometimes the devil uses just normal things to trip us up. Sometimes people will move. They just like stayed one place for many, many years. They just stayed, stayed, stayed. They get saved. They start growing, growing, growing in the Lord because they're near their church and they're going, 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 going to church. And something will happen and all of a sudden, oh, I have to move. And they'll move like far from the place of their spiritual, spiritual development. And then it's like they have no car, they can't drive back and forth, or it's too far to get on the bus and come, or whatever the situation is, and they lose. I've seen people who were like really, uh, people planning to go into ministry, planning to preach the gospel, and then all of a sudden they just like move to another state where there's no deaf ministry. It's like, is there a deaf church in your... Well, no. And then their spiritual development explodes on them. There is a plan to destroy your spiritual life. Someone in the dark world is plotting against your spiritual growth. Don't let them fool you. God always has a better plan. If that thing that you want, see, the Satan, the enemy uses what we want to tempt us. We want this. We want this. We want this. And so, oh, that pops up, and we're just like, 
That's exactly what I've been wanting, and we try to grab it. And we don't even think, is this really God's plan? Now, I want to tell you, God knows what you want. And some people think if I chase God, he will not give me the things I want. I will have to lose everything I want. That is not my experience with God. I have chased God all my life. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't sound like to me, he won't give you anything you want. It sounds like satisfy yourself in him, seek him, love him, follow him, chase him, and he will give you what you want. That's a wonderful promise. Saul finds out, maybe the Holy Spirit told Saul. Now, we already uh, saw Saul have one vision of God coming in the bright light and talking to him. We already uh, know that an angel appeared to Saul in the room and said, a man named Ananias is coming to pray for you to receive your sight, your blindness to be healed. So maybe he had a dream and saw people plotting to kill him. I don't know. But I know this, Saul realized what was happening. Someone was planning to kill him. And notice how patient the devil is. When he's trying to destroy someone, he was watching the gate day and night, day and night, day and night. Now he was using human people, just like God uses human people to do his work on earth. On earth, God uses human people to do his work most of the time. Most of what happened in this book happened through a human person. In the same way, the enemy uses human people to destroy, trying to destroy Saul. Now, I think that this plan was a pretty big plan, and I think it was full of great power of evil because Saul, God, had such a big plan for Saul. But, you know, I don't know if Saul really understood how big the plan God had for him was. He probably thought he was not that important. Then the disciples took Saul by night and let him down over the wall in a basket. See? God works in different ways to bring deliverance, to bring freedom. It isn't always um, exciting. You know, getting in a basket, somebody putting a lid on, tying a rope around the handles, and letting it over the side, letting you down, that's not very... 007. You know, it's not very exciting, I see. Uh, no, it's not like James Bourne, you know. It's just not. Oh, excuse me, Jason Bourne. Um, what? 
Oh, <laughs> he says they were trying to make a pinata out of Saul. You know, just put him in a basket and bang him up the side. But you see, it wasn't very glorious. God sent an angel to fly down and grab him and lift him up and carry him and put him down like he did Philip. You know, God works different ways, different times with different people for different reasons. We never know what God's going to do with us. And we keep waiting and waiting and waiting for God to do something exciting with us. And it's just like, same, same, same. And we're just like, what's up with that? Where is my God moment? But Saul humbled himself, crawled in the basket. Now, Saul, uh, according to history, was a small man. He wasn't big. You know, he could fit in a basket. You know, if he'd been too big, too heavy, those people would not have been able to let him over the side. God designed a plan that was perfect for Saul. From there, from Damascus, Saul traveled to Jerusalem. There's one more thing I want to say about Damascus. Last week we read that Saul preached and the people listened and many accepted the Lord. Many were saved. But there's this plot to kill him. What is that? What can we learn from that? Not everyone will love you. If you are involved in the work of God and you just want everyone to love you, not going to happen. There's always going to be someone that doesn't like you. And you have to be able to bear that. I wish everyone loved me, but I know that's not the fact. I wish everyone just thought I was perfect, but it's not true, I guess because I'm not perfect, <laughs> but I have seen in the church people, you know, they're growing in God, they receive the Holy Spirit, and they're like, motivated to serve God and work for God and they're working in the church and they're going on and the people in the church vote them to become on the board of the church and, and at first they're like excited. They got promoted, you know, and then someone gets mad at them for a decision that the three people on the board made together, voted. And, you know, they say, oh, you were against me. Well, and then they don't like them. And then that person is like, oh. <gasps> they quit. They resign. I've seen that happen before more than one time. Because they can't bear that everyone doesn't love them. Everyone doesn't agree with them. One thing you will notice about people that God places into ministry they can handle when everyone doesn't love them. Do they like it? No. Is it fun? No. Will it kill me? Probably not. Not many people who hated me 
tried to kill me. Mostly they just gossip about me. Mostly that's it. Talk. Learn how to bear talk. Learn how to handle it. Learn to listen when people talk. I listen. Learn to evaluate. I think about what they say. Am I wrong? Are they right? If they are right, I go to them and say, you know what, I listened to what you said. I agree with you. I was wrong. And I might have to stand up in front of people and say, people, I was wrong. I can handle that. But if I analyze, I look at the Word of God, I pray, I ask for godly counsel, and, and they're wrong, I just let it go. Let them talk. I can handle that. I can bear that. Spiritual maturity can bear if everyone doesn't love them. Did everyone love Jesus? No. But Jesus was perfect. Why didn't everyone see that Jesus was perfect and just fall in love with him? I don't know. I try to figure that out. It's like, why can't people see how wonderful God is? And just fall in love with him. I don't know. <clears throat> when Saul uh, had arrived at Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So Saul has left Jerusalem. He's gone to Damascus. He gets saved on the way. You know, he preaches in Damascus, and, and so, many believe. The Bible said many believe. And then, you know, he travels back to Jerusalem, and he arrives there Expecting maybe that people, the church, are going to receive, accept him. But instead, they're like, they're afraid of him. They remember Saul's past. Don't be afraid of people who remember your past. People will gossip about your past. Recently, uh, I know a situation where someone wrote letters to many people telling a lie about a person's past. And you know, I don't know if the people believed it or not. But I happen to know about that person's past, and I know that was a lie. <laughs> I know 100% sure it was a lie. It's like, how did that lie about, about something that happened 30 years ago? How is that still alive and circulating as gossip? The devil is chasing someone. They were afraid of Saul's history. He's a murderer. He stood and threw stones at Stephen, and Stephen died. They put the the coats at his feet. You know, we don't know if he actually threw stones or not, but I'm sure that's what the gossip was. Maybe Saul did.
didn't throw one stone. Maybe not. Maybe he just stood there with all these clothes at your feet, you know. But everyone's afraid of him. And he went to grab people and throw them in jail who believed in Jesus. So now they're afraid. They only remember his past. They don't know his present. And they don't know what God has spoken about his future. But Barnabas took him to the apostles. Now, we sign Barnabas with B's. We use the sign encouragement. Encouragement. Barnabas encouraged people. Barnabas liked to help new people starting out. You know, I like to help new uh, men and women who are training to go into the ministry, I like to help them. When they're starting out, when they're learning still, and they're in the process of obeying God, I like that. That is a good thing. And that's what Barnabas, he liked to do that. And he takes Paul and he says, come on, I'll help you. We can learn a lesson from this. Sometimes we are too quick to try to defend ourselves. Saul allowed Barnabas to explain his testimony to the apostles. Let's read and see. It says, Barnabas took him to the apostles, and Barnabas declared to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road, and how the Lord had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus the name of Jesus. So here's the lesson that we can learn about this if we're, we're starting out in our journey of ministry. Sometimes it's best just to be quiet and let someone else defend you. Everyone trusted Barnabas because Barnabas was an encourager. People like encouragers. When you meet someone who's like, cheerful and encouraging and come on, you can do it. You like them. There's, there's many different kinds of people in the church, but often we see two kinds. We see the encouragers who are very positive and they're smiling and they're, come on, you can do it, and they're lifting you up. They're helping you. And then there's the, the people who are... Um, disciplining you. It's like some people, God has chosen them to um, like, a, like a, a statue, you know, where uh, the artist has to take a, a, he has this big old block, a square stone, and, and then he starts just like chiseling away, chiseling away, chiseling away, rubbing it, rubbing it. You know, cutting, 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 until it looks like something. That God chooses some people in our lives to do that to us. To be that person that point, points out our weakness. So we can pray about that and change that. And we don't like those people. They're always negative, negative, negative. Why don't they say anything positive to me? But just remember, God has some people molding you. And God has some people encouraging you. We all want 
want God to choose us to be the encourager. Sometimes I just wish I could be that little person that's just always positive and just always happy and always telling you, good job, good job. And I try to do that. But I know that part of what God has put in me is to help people get rid of the things that block their potential for success in ministry. So sometimes I have to say to them, you know what? You know what's the the thing that's blocking your way to ministry? I hate to say that. But sometimes we have to say that. Sometimes we have to say that. So, you know, what kind of person has God designed you to be? It requires maturity and stubbornness and patience. And we try to give bad news soft, you know, if it's possible. But sometimes we need to look people in the eye and say, the devil is after you. And this is how he's working. He's trying to convince you to go off. You better get back on the path. Sometimes we have to be hard. It's not easy. But Barnabas was able to bring Saul, tell his story. Everyone trusted Barnabas, and the apostles believed him. If Saul had gone in and tried to explain, explain my story, you know, who knows if they would have believed or not. I wonder, I wonder if Barnabas, how Barnabas knew about Saul's history. Or... He knew before that Saul was a believer. I think uh, Barnabas had already heard what happened in Damascus, or maybe he would, had traveled there and seen for himself, I think. Uh, but it seems that he knew, or maybe the Spirit of God told him. You know, God communicates. That was interesting. Someone told me uh, last week, they said to me, they said, you know, I had never heard the voice of God speak to me before, but I received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and just one or two days later, I heard the voice of God for the first time. See, the Holy Spirit is powerful in our lives. It's not just a game. It's not just something that we do because of tradition. There's power in that to understand and hear God. So, uh, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit told Barnabas. We don't know for sure. Maybe Barnabas had been there. The, the Bible might tell us if Barnabas was there. I just don't remember it if it does. That's a big book. I have learned some interesting things in this uh, big book this week. You, you study this book, it's like really interesting. But I better not get off track. Jesus had transformed everything about Saul. When Saul saw the Lord, he was transformed. There's a verse in the Bible that says, when we arrive in heaven and we see Jesus as he is, we will be like him. Here we try and try and try to be like him the best we can, and we just feel like we fail. We feel like we missed the mark. 
even when we're trying our best. But the Bible says, when you see him, you will be like him. Because you will see him as he is. Saul had seen Jesus as he is. It tra- changed. His thinking changed. You know, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Maybe it says, to be renewed in your mind. Get a new mind. That's what happened to Saul when he saw Jesus. Boom, he got a new mind. He didn't think the same old way he always thought before. Everything changed in his thinking. He got a new uh, set of emotions. Before, there was a lot of anger in Saul. He's going out breathing. The Bible says he was breathing threatenings and slaughter. He was a mean guy. Evil, killing, killing, violent. And then all of a sudden, transformation. You know, he became a man that sewed nets or tents, tents, tents. You know, from a murderer who's going out breathing threatenings and slaughter, grabbing people, throwing them in jail, men, women. To a man that sold tents to support himself so he could preach the gospel. Transformation. His goals changed. Sometimes we see people that that uh, they have their goals in life set, you know, and then they get saved. And they try to keep their same goals. Sometimes God allows that, but sometimes God says, here's you a new set of goals. Work on these. No. I know a young woman recently who... uh, She's in Bible college, and she's planning to go someplace after she graduates to be involved in, in uh, missionary work, but she's getting, like, really close to graduation. And at the last minute, the Lord just, like, offered this, and it was, like, truly God, and many, many proofs that it was God. And it was just, like, my goals. Now this. Does it mean that she has to throw those goals away? Maybe, maybe, yes. Maybe no. Maybe later in life, this will be complete, and God will say, now, this set of goals. But if she does not obey God, if she holds on to this, and God's saying this, 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 This is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. If she ignores that, maybe both this and this will fail. Or maybe what she will be able to accomplish here will be small. Because God planned for her to meet people and be involved with people who can provide the financial support for a big something here later. So we have to be careful. Saul, he got a whole new set of goals. And yet, in some ways, God used what was already in the heart of Saul. 
you know, remember what Ananias prophesied to him or what God told Ananias about Saul? He said, I have a big plan for him to preach to kings. I think Saul was a political type of person before he was saved. He was connected to the high priest of the church. And when, you know, he was ready to do something, he approached the high priest and got permission, got a letter, okay, approval to go and do his work. People like that are aggressive. I have met them. I, I admire that. It's like they accomplish a lot. People who are courageous and they, they go to the top. Like I know I have a friend that if you bring that person into a new environment with many new people that you, they have never met before, that person will look at everybody, see what everyone is doing, and they will zero in on the most important person in the room, and they will go right up to meet that person. See, I'm the opposite of that. When I get in a big room full of people I don't know, I go over, I find a chair, I sit down at a table, and I hope there's a table there to get in front of me and give me some defense and I, I sit down and I just watch everybody and I would never just approach the most important person in the room and put out my hand and say hello I am this and, and let me give you my business card I'm not that kind of person but my friend is God uses all different kinds of people that person is more of a political type than me. I don't have to meet the most important person in the room. My feeling is I already know Jesus. He is the most important person in this room. So I don't need to meet the most important people here. I always think, if God wants me to meet that person, God will bring them to me. I never think, oh, i got to go meet them. Come on, come on, let's meet them. I'm just like, you go, you go meet them. That's fine. I'll stay here. But Paul, you know, he had these goals. I think he was politically... He was a Roman citizen. He was connected to the high priest in the Jewish church because he was a Jew. He was connected to Caesar because he was a Roman. God changed everything about Saul. Acts 9.28. At Damascus, uh, he preached at Damascus the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Saul saw Jesus one time in all the rest of his life. Everything was focused on Jesus. Everything was about Jesus. Everything he did, everything he said, every decision he made, it was all about Jesus. Saul recognized that Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the most powerful. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus came to die for us. Jesus is coming again. Jesus rose from the dead. Saul focus on one thing, Jesus. 
it seems that the words of Barnabas succeeded because uh, in verse 29, it says, So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming and going, coming and going. In other words, the people accepted him. He was fellowshipping with the believers in Jerusalem now. Because of one man who was an encourager, who took him by the hand and helped him meet the right people, the apostles. When they got the approval of the apostles, then all the other people accepted them too. He spoke boldly in the name of Jesus and disputed with the Hellenists. Now, the Hellenists were Greek people. You see, Paul, he knew a little bit. He was involved in, with the Jews. He was involved with the Romans. Now we see he's involved with the Greeks. No. And he's debating. Now, let's think about the Greeks. The Greeks are the ones who believe in what we call mythology. All of those stories that you read in school or those movies you've watched about Greek mythology, that, that was the religion of the Greek people. They believed in Zeus. They believed in all those different, 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 different gods. Small g, not big god. Small god. Idols. They worshipped the sun, the moon, and the sun. And so now Saul, he's debating these people. Now we'll tell you about the Greeks. The Greeks were educated. They were brilliant, minded people. They were educated. And so that means for Saul to be able to debate with them, he was educated too. He had studied under Gamaliel, I believe, a Greek. He knew all about their beliefs through and through. He knew about the Romans. He knew about the Jews. God had chosen a man that could fit many cultures. Not just one culture. Some people have that gift. Pastor Rod has that gift. It doesn't matter where you bring Pastor Rod. Any country in the world, he will approach deaf people there who have different sign language than his, and he'll strike up a conversation. You bring Pastor Rod into a, an environment that's all hearing people, if there's no interpreter, he'll just get up himself and try to communicate the best he can. We all know Pastor Rod doesn't have expert speech. He knows that too, but he has something in him that enables him to cross the cultures. It doesn't matter if it's hearing or deaf or Korean or Hawaiian or... Chinese, or he's been many places and he fits, 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 fits. That's the kind of person that Paul, uh, Saul was. And God chose him. I don't know how many languages he knew. I don't know. No. He probably knew quite a few. He probably knew Greek and he probably knew Hebrew, and he probably knew uh, um, Aramaic. Aramaic. Those are the three languages the Bible is written in. 
originally, the first scrolls were written in three different languages. So some were written in Hebrew, some were written in Greek, some were written in Aramaic. So he probably knew those three, and he probably knew Latin, possibly. I don't know for sure. When the brothers found out that people were seeking to kill Saul, see, it's like no matter where he goes, people are against him. They brought him to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Now, Tarsus was Saul's hometown. That was his home. He was born there, he, or grew up there. So um, that was his hometown. They brought him there to hide him. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria, had peace and were unified. Having peace and unity is God's desire. In Psalm 133, verse 1, it says, It is good for the brothers to dwell together in unity. It's good to dwell together in unity. It's good for the church to have peace. When Saul stopped persecuting the Christians, it helped. He was the leading person involved in that. Now later, worse and worse and worse persecution popped up, yes. But for a while, there was peace and unity. The brothers and sisters in Christ were united. They were working together to spread the gospel. That's what we have to do. Walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I think it's interesting that these two things are connected with the word and. The fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They're connected. Oftentimes, people try to separate those two things. And it's like, focus on the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. And they preach and preach and preach and preach about that, but they never quite get to the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Or the opposite is true. There are some preachers that are just like, comfort, 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 smile, enjoy yourself in the Lord. God is good. God is love. God is... The same Bible that says God is love says the fear of the Lord. That's hard for us to understand. But I believe these are connected for a reason. I believe it's when we understand the fear of the Lord, we are able to feel the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Let me explain about how that works. Um, suppose, you know, um, some, some little kids are timid. Timid. And when they see a great big person, you know, they're just like, if that person is loud or noisy, they're just like a little bit afraid of them. You know. And maybe if that child was in the room with that person alone, they're going to get way over here somewhere and they're going to sit far away. But suppose someone else came into the room and went over to the little child and started screaming at them, whatever, what do you think the little child might do? They might run and hide behind this big old person. 
because they know that big old person that was a little bit scary a while ago can conquer them, this person that's yelling at me. They can help me. They're big enough. I can't fight this person that's yelling at me, but, oh, they can. Maybe they're going to hide behind them. It's just common sense. So the same is true when we understand how fearful our God is, how mighty he is, how he can destroy the works of the enemy, how he can conquer those who come against us. We find comfort. I have a protector. I have a protector. I have a protector. That's why they're connected. Fear of the Lord. I hear people say, oh, that doesn't mean be afraid of God. Yes, it means be afraid of God. The Bible is clear on that. It says it several times. It says, don't be afraid of the one who can destroy your body. Be afraid, that means the devil. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and spirit in hell. That's God. The Bible says it. Be afraid of that. Be afraid enough to obey. I'm afraid enough of God to obey him. At the same time, I find great comfort in the fact that I know God. It's like that verse I was talking to you about last week. I haven't forgotten that, Isaiah 48, 18. This says, when we obey him, then there's peace like a river. It's the same theme again. Fear and comfort. Obedience and peace. It's the same theme again. We're finding it here in the book of Acts. It says comfort was multiplied when they lived in the fear of the Lord. It's like uh, when you're out in a storm. You know, it's it's like uh, stay staying under the umbrella. As long as I stay under the umbrella of God and obey Him, obey Him, obey Him, He will protect me from the storm. when I put my umbrella down and go out on my own that I get struck by lightning. No. Now, we change from the story of Saul and we start on the story of Peter. And we're going to look at this some, uh, we're going to look at this next week because it's time for us to be finished tonight. But uh, God had a plan for Saul. God worked with uneducated fishermen, and God worked with brilliant scholars like Saul. Now, you notice in this story, they are still calling him Saul. They have not forgotten his history yet. Sometimes it takes time to live beyond your history. Sometimes it takes years before people realize, oh, I guess he changed. I guess she changed. It didn't take Saul that long, but in this story, we're still seeing the name Saul. It takes time to 
to stop living in our flesh and start living in His Spirit. And there's a training time and there's a process involved. Later we will see His name change. But right now, all through this story in the book of Acts 9, you will see the word Saul, Saul, Saul. That means something. It's there for a reason. God decided which word would go in there. And God decides when it's time to make a change of the word. So uh, we'll study more about that later, but next week we're going to talk about Peter. Any questions about tonight? Anybody? Everyone satisfied? If you think of a question and you need to ask me, feel free to ask me questions. I will try to answer. Let's stand. I'm going to pray that God will help us to know who we are. All through this, we begin to see who Saul is and how he's changing and what God wants him to become and what he was and how it all fits together. Um, You need to find out where you are related to your past, your goals, your dreams, your future. Where are you? Where does God want you to be? Um, I'm going to pray for God to reveal to you about yourself. You need to know that. It's not good enough for us just to waltz through life and never know who we are. What God designed me to do. What God designed me to be. God wants you to know where he's going to put you, what he's going to do. He doesn't tell you every detail all at once. He didn't tell Saul everything all at once. But he gave him a little bit of information. And tonight I'm going to pray that God's revelation will come to you and that sometime this week he will give you a little bit of information. You can learn something about your spiritual self, who you are in Christ, who he wants you to become in him. And I hope that you will open yourself up to receive that from God. Heavenly Father, I approach you tonight. We have looked at Brother Saul's life, his beginning, and how you began to transform him. And it makes our own heart desire to be transformed. And God, I know the young ones who are here, much younger than I, are looking at the future Who has God made me to be? What are my God goals? Where am I going? What am I going to do? What is your design, God? I ask, Holy Spirit, revealer of mysteries, show these, your people, Just drop a seed of information in their hearts this week. Let it be clear. We know it won't be all encompassing everything about them, but it will be one thing that you most desire for them to know about themselves. Lord Jesus, I ask that you will do this. Holy Spirit, I believe that you desire this. Reveal, reveal, reveal. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. God bless.